Well, welcome. My name is Chad. If I haven't met you yet, that was my wife, Jillian. We have been the location pastors here at Hope for uh, almost a year and a half now. Uh, we started in November of 2020, so it's so cool to be a part of Scotts Valley. You guys are still one of the best towns I've ever seen, ever been a part of. So, I mean, it's not saying much. I lived in Gilroy and San Jose. It's only three other spots, so you're at least on the podium. So that's good. We'll give ourselves a hand for that. But <laughs> we... Um, we are going to start a new mini-series, like just a little mini-series, two-week two week series on becoming. Becoming. So today we're going to look at becoming love. How do we become love? We're called to more than just loving people. We're called to more than just having actions of love. We're called to more than just be, being loving. We're called to be love. We're called to be in the image of God. We're called to a different standard, to a new level and so that's what we're going to look at today. How do you become something new? Well, the Bible tells us that we're a new creation, right? So we, we didn't do the, the, the difference. We made the choice to acknowledge Jesus as our Lord and Savior, but then the Holy Spirit does the work. He does the changing. He does the transformation. So we're going to take a look at that. And to give us a little picture on how this might work, um, I have had a handful of surgeries in my life, and I've had a handful of injuries in my life. And... All of those involved physical therapy. Anyone else had physical therapy before? It's the best, isn't it? It's the worst. In fact, when you don't do your physical therapy is when you get hurt again. When I was, how old was I? I was in a seventh grade. I was in seventh grade. So I was, what are you, 12, 13, in seventh grade? And my older brother was, a, was wrestling for the high school, and I was wrestling for the middle school. I wasn't very good yet. I had only been doing it for a little bit. But he had been doing it for a couple years, and Gilroy High has an amazing wrestling program, so he was teaching me stuff that he had learned. So I'm, I'm hoping to be starting in eighth grade, be the starting wrestler in my, in my weight class. So my older brother starts showing me some stuff, and we're wrestling in my room, and he grabs, the, it might get a little graphic, so if you're squeamish, I'm sorry, I'm squeamish, so I get it. He grabs a single leg, and, he, and I try to sprawl, and he doesn't let me sprawl, and he drops his shoulder into the inside of my knee. I dislocate my knee, screaming crazy. I'm 13, I didn't do physical therapy, right? <laughs> Who at 13 year old is really do, gonna do physical therapy for six weeks? I was like, uh, I can walk, I'm skateboarding again. Guess what happens? Oh, well it becomes a chronic issue when you don't let it heal fully. But in that physical therapy, I realized that I wasn't injured anymore, right? I had, my, my joints were all in the right spot where they're supposed to be, how they're supposed to be. I could walk on it. I wasn't injured anymore. But I also wasn't healed yet. You see how that, you guys tracking that? I wasn't injured anymore, but I wasn't healed either. I was in this middle ground. I was in the middle. And that's, that's kind of where we are as Christ followers. We're saved, but we're not spotless yet. See, we are viewed through the lens of Jesus. That's how we become saved. But I still sin. I don't know about you, but I still sin daily, almost like I'm paid to do it. <laughs> if I got, I mean, I'd, 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 I'd be a millionaire if I was paid to sin. Whew. But I'm not, I'm not quite a saint yet. I'm not quite spotless yet. And I won't ever be in this life because I am a sinner who's saved by grace, not by my works, not by anything I did, but by the love of Jesus, the grace of Jesus, his life being poured out on the cross for me because God gave his only son. That's where I get my salvation. But then I'm stuck in this middle zone. I'm stuck in this, this middle part where I'm no longer injured, but I'm not yet healed. So we're going to take a deep, uh, a semi-deep dive into that. But before we get there, we're going to buckle up. We've got a big chunk of passage, uh, scripture to read. It'll be on the, the big Bible in the sky, or if you have your Bibles, it's uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 through 21. So here we go. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how 
God showed his amazing love or his love among us. He sent his only, one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. We're known by our love. He has given us of his spirit and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In the world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God, whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brothers and sisters. That's a lot of, that's a, that's a lot of text. But I think the mega theme we could all agree on is love, right? Love is the mega theme that we can agree on in that. And that God is, this, is, is love and teaches us how to love. And that we are supposed to, then love others the same way. Love God and love people, right? And what's really cool, I'll give you a little background on John. So this, this uh, section of John was actually written in, late in John's life. John was an, apo- uh, an apostle that walked with Jesus. He's one of the original 12. And this is written late in his life in the, around the church of Ephesus, okay? So he is old. He was young when he walked with Jesus. He's been, he's been following Jesus and, and sharing the way most of his life, and now he's old, and he's wanting to pass on this wisdom, wanting to pass on this knowledge, this firsthand experience to the next generation. You see, if you don't care about the next generation, you don't understand revival. He understood that the next generation was going to win the battle. It's always about passing it on to the next, because Jesus says the church will always be taking ground will always be moving forward. And so if you're no longer here to move forward with it, you have to share it, your wisdom, pass it on so that the next generation can take it where you left off. And he's also one of the only remain, if not the only remaining disciple, the original 12 alive. Most of them had already been uh, murdered or martyred or had just passed away. By this time, when he was writing this, so he's, he's like the last OG. He's like Snoop Dogg. Right, if you watched the Super Bowl last week, you get that reference. If not, it's all good. Um, he was an old, old guy who knew Jesus firsthand. And a lot of, these, a lot of this, his, this writing in, in 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John is about the Christian life. It's kind of the, the what to expect or the how to the Christian Christianity for Dummies book, right? I love those things because I'm not the most like studious dude. So if it can get the four dummies copy, abridged version, audio, I'm down. <laughs> but he's looking at the Christian life and becoming Christ-like. And it's this big, crazy word called sanctification. Now it's very Christianese, it's very churchy. You don't walk around saying that word in your everyday life, sanctification. Really what it means is that you've been set apart. Now, not set apart as in we're better than someone. We're set apart as in we've been covered and pulled away by the blood of Jesus. We've been set apart as holy because of what Jesus did, not because of anything we did. And so let's just, we're going to look at the Christian life and how we are Christ-like. And then John also explores the personification of love. 
that Christ is love. God is love. And the, the person of Jesus displayed that love on the cross. And we are called to be Christ-like. In fact, Christians translated as little Christs. We're all just little Christs. Just walking around trying to look like our daddy, right? We're just imitating it and, and trying to reflect the perfection of Jesus in our life. And so some questions that might come up that I'm hoping to answer, I'm not going to make a guarantee um, because guarantees never work out in my favor. I'm going to hope to answer some questions like, what is happening to us in this process? What, what does this look like? What's happening to us as Christ followers? Or, I hear what you're saying, but I look at my life and it doesn't line up. The tension that I have between what I know I should do and what I'm doing, or what I know I shouldn't do and I keep doing, that tension. How do we live in that tension? How do we understand that tension? Or, does this make me better than other people? Like, Am I, am I pious and set apart? I'm above, I'm self-righteous? Uh-uh. So we're going we're gonna to look at some of this stuff and, and get there. And the words of Jesus kind of give us a, a launching point from Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's almost as if Jesus is saying, come to me, learn from me, release what you have, give me everything you've got, and then your soul will find peace, will find rest. It's almost as if following Jesus and learning how to do life like Jesus did is a soothing aspect for our soul that nothing else can quench. It's what refreshes us, learning how to live like Jesus and I love that Jesus modeled it. Jesus, I think I've said this before, but I had one PE coach that would just blow a whistle and make me run laps. I had one PE coach that would say, let's run laps, and he would run with us. I always ran more. Not much more, but a little bit more for Coach Adam because he ran with us. He didn't just tell us what to do and sit back. Jesus doesn't just ask you to do something or tell you to do something that he didn't already do first. He asks us to love our enemies. Well, he loved his enemies before he ever asked us to do that. While we were still sinners, he saved us. He gave, he gave himself for us while we were still He loved his enemies. He loved me as his enemy before I ever acknowledged him as my savior. So we make the choice. He makes the change. He's a, God's a gentleman. That's one thing that's so amazing about God is he's a gentleman. He will sit there and knock and wait for you to open the door and invite him in. He will never stop knocking, but he will never kick down your door. He's a gentleman. Will you make the choice? He makes the change. And I want to kind of narrow in from that big passage. I want to narrow into 1 John chapter 4, 16 and 17 where it says, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. That's a big idea right there. Really big idea. I mean, you're starting like way up in, in the cosmos right there with God. God is love. That's where we're starting. We're just going to kick off there. God is love. Hold on, that's huge. And then it starts to talk about walking in confidence on the day of judgment because we are like Christ, because we, we are like Jesus. That's big too. I mean, these are, this is not a simple concept to really grab or, or digest and then apply to our life. Or is it? Is it really simple? Because it really sounds like God's going from the heavens to the heart to the hands. That's what, that's what, when you really understand and feel the love of God and God's in you and you're in God, when you abide in him, when you follow the example, you step in the steps he's already taken, it, it's easy. It's easy. It's just God's up here. God is love. God gets love into your heart. And then your heart becomes your actions. And 
you have love coming from your hands to everyone around you. It's, it's really simple when you break it down. But here's, here's where we get twisted. Here's what makes it complicated. Is the Bible says God is love. But humanity has kind of reordered that and said love is God. Same, same, but different. Uh Uh-uh, way wrong. Huge miss to think that love is God because we, as humans, want to follow our hearts. I'm just going to pause for a second. If you have friends that give you that advice to follow your heart, don't ever take their advice, please, please. Please don't ever take the advice, follow your heart. Because, as we know, the way we operate as humans is that we think love is a feeling. We think love is a selfish aspect of who we are. I don't feel the love in this place. I want to feel love. I fell in love. I fell out of love. Well, when love is really a choice and an action, you can't fall in or fall out. You either step in or step out. It's different when you really look at love is the choice and the action behind it, the motive. So don't ever follow your heart because that will just, I mean, the heart is deceitful above all else. You will fool yourself so well. You will trick yourself into so many problems. And let me tell you, it's a choice sometimes to love some people in my life literal choice that I've had to say out loud to myself, "Ah, you love that person. I'm not going to say who it is. I'm looking in the mirror, though, okay? (laughs) No, but you guys know you have to make that choice. You have to make that choice. I didn't wake up one day and just fall into love with Jillian. It was a, a compound of actions and choices that led to love. Unfortunately, I have the free will and the freedom that I could make the choice to not love her anymore and walk away. Now, would it be void of of difficulty, void of heartache, void of problems, void of bad feelings? No, it'd still have that, but I could make that choice. Now, here we're at. I'm not saying I would ever make that choice. I'm saying I could make that choice. I I wouldn't make that choice. I love my wife because I choose to. Even, even when it's hard, even when, when, when we're not seeing eye to eye, I choose to love her. And by God, thank God she chooses to love me too. Because let me tell you, I'm probably the harder one to love. If you've been around both of us, you'd probably, you can nod. It's okay. I'm not going to get offended. You guys can just say, yep, yep, yep. But here, here's an observation that we're going we're gonna to look into from this from this, from the heavens to the heart to the hands. It's a process. It's a process. It doesn't just happen overnight. It's not just a bippity boppity boop. It's a slug crawl sometimes. It's difficult. It's a lot of falling down. It's a lot of missing the mark. It's a lot of repentance. It's a lot of forgiveness. It's a lot of heartache. It's a lot of difficulty. But it's always worth it. It is worth it to become love. Not to just be more loving, but to become love. Just like we were talking about with physical therapy, after a while, one day I kind of just realized, hey, my knee's not as, it doesn't hurt as bad anymore. Hey, I can do more again. Hey, my knee's getting stronger, and I could go back to my daily life. It didn't just happen right after surgery. I was able to, you know, do anything and everything I wanted again. Took some time. Took some work. Took some pain. But one day it happened. So one day we will become the reflection of Jesus. And I pray that every day I'm a little bit, my reflection is a little bit crisper. Pray that every day I can reflect Jesus a little bit more. I pray that that others can see Christ in me. I want to decrease so he can increase. But that comes from understanding that sanctification is a process. 
It's a process. Salvation is an instant. Sanctification is a process. And then we have to understand the definition, God's definition of love. If God is love, we should listen to love about love. I mean, is that, does that make sense? I mean, am I, lo- am I the only one there? It's like, if I'm going to learn about love, I should go to the source. You should go to the source of love to learn about love. Here's the source. Here's the source. God is love, the word of God. Learn about love. Learn his definition for love. and Let it change and transform and renew your perspective of love. Because one thing I've found out when I'm reading the Bible and I disagree with something, I'm the problem. I'm the one who's wrong when I read the Bible and I disagree with it. And trust me, there's times where I read the Bible and go, I don't know, I don't know if I agree with that. And God invites it. He invites it. He's like, why not? What, don't, what, what doesn't make sense about that for you? And then I realize after pursuing and, and getting to know God more that I'm the one who needs to have my perspective changed, my viewpoint shifted, that I'm the one who's off axis, not God. And here's, here's something that Jesus said from Luke 6 that helps me in my process. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Can you say to your brother, brother, let me get that speck out of your eye when yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. I'm going to just... I'm just going to lay it out on the, on the table right now. I got a huge plank in my eye. I might even have two. It might be going through my head. Like, it is, I mean, it's like horror movie stuff. And Jesus has the loving compassion to call me a hypocrite about it because I'm ignoring this big plank in my eye. And I'm going to other people, well, you know what it would fix your life? Let me tell you. Excuse me? How would you know? you got a huge plank in your eye. I just got this little speck. How many times have you had someone with zero, I mean zero, knowledge on a subject try to tell you that, like, what to do? It's fun, isn't it? It's fun. I try to be really nice and nod my head. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's how I should do it. Okay, thank you. And then they keep going. Oh, man. Test my patience. And I live in that, I live in that zone. That's, that's the tension. That's the tension that we have, right? Where we have the knowledge, but we don't have the action. You have the knowledge, but you don't have the action. I know what to do. I know the right thing to do. When my children are screaming because they are just tired and hungry and they're making zero sense, I know what to do. But I don't always do it. I know that if I get frustrated and and raise my level, they're just going to match me and we're just going to get in this, this elevating scream fest. When I know, I know what they need is some food. What I know is they need is a nap. But I don't always do it. Sometimes I do, and I pat myself on the back and try to get it the next time and mess up. I know to give grace to people when they cut me off on the highway. I was just drove through San Jose. I do not miss that driving style. Once you get on the 85, it's like the speed limit no longer exists. Lanes are not really there anymore. It's just a wild west, and I don't like it. I don't like it at all. I know I should have the grace, and I shouldn't speed up to them and tailgate them or get in front of them and slow really down and pin them in on other people so they're honking and trying. I know I shouldn't do that. Sometimes it's so, I mean, clearly I do that. I have details, right? Like, (laughs) clearly, you guys just saw a window into how I operate behind a wheel. Sometimes we know how to live our life but not always have the actions to back it up, right? That's the tension that is the Christian life. 
And I think a big key, key part to this is really understanding this concept. It's more about being than doing. It's more about being than doing. If your private time with Jesus draws you closer to him, you become more in the image of him. And when you get out into the world, it's going to be easier to do the right thing because the right roots are starting to bear fruit. We have to get alone with Jesus and let him do the work so that we are more like him. And it just is second nature for us to emulate Christ, to model Christ. It's more about being than doing. The Bible talks about that in a few passages, that it's more about being than doing. I mean, there's an old saying, the proof is in the pudding, right? Don't talk about it, be about it. Talk is cheap, action's expensive. All those euphemisms, because we know this concept. It's not new. I'm not coming here with some revolutionary thought. It's old stuff. And Jesus says in Luke 6, he says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, and puts them into practice, will show you what they are like. They are like a man being, building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck the house, but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who builds a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck the house, that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. If we're not digging down deep to the foundation of Jesus, when we have those moments of testing, when we have those moments of, our, uh, of opportunity to be patient, we will be swept away. Because when I, look at, when I look at love as a feeling rather than a choice and an action, it's like water. It's going to find the lowest common denominator. My moments will dictate my mood. When you have a solid foundation, moments can't touch your mood. It can't shake it. Because you're not acting kind. You're not acting loving. You just are. You're being, not trying. And I love this because the Apostle Paul, I, I think, is just like, he's my spirit animal sometimes. Him and, and Peter sometimes, because Peter was like, bah, flies off the handle. And Paul's like, in Romans 6 and 7, he talks about like grace isn't a license to sin. He has to make that, that notion to people like, Hold on, just because Jesus died for you and gave you grace on all your sin doesn't mean you can go, sweet, jackpot, I'm going to go, I'm going to go sin it up, woo, right? I needed to hear that. And then he also says stuff like this, man, I know what to do and I'm not doing it. And the things I know I shouldn't do, I keep doing. I'm like, Paul, thank you. You just like, you gave me a hug right now, bud, because I find myself not doing what I know I should do. And doing what I know I shouldn't do all too often. But I want to encourage us today that when you start to feel and understand and see that what you did was wrong, that's growth. There are so many things in my life that I didn't even know was sin until I found out that it was sin. And I was like, what? I've been doing that for 20 years. That's not okay. Ignorance. Right? But once I understood that it was wrong and God had started to work at my heart, repentance could come through. I could turn from that. I could, I could make amends with people once I understood that what I was doing was wrong. So if you're feeling guilty, if you're feeling the tug of the Holy Spirit that what, something that you're doing is wrong, that's a good sign. That's not shame. That's not condemnation. That's love and compassion drawing you closer to be more like Christ. We should celebrate the times where we feel the need to repent because that means the Holy Spirit is alive and active and working in your heart. 
Repentance is one of the best gifts ever, and it gets the worst rap. Because it takes humility to acknowledge that I was wrong. My way is not right. Jesus, help me. It takes so much for us to admit that we're wrong and then ask for help. That's what repentance is. Then we get down to the motive. What's the motive? Desiring to live right out of gratitude and not fear. We just change. When we start being instead of doing, it's really just from a heart perspective. It's really just a motive shift. Because the actions, if you're doing kind things or being kind, the actions are going to line up. But the motive is going to be different, right? When you're doing it out of a response in gratitude to the love and the grace of Jesus, it's easy. When you're doing it out of fear from being punished for not doing it, or you're doing it out of, out of selfish ambition because you might gain something from it, that's where your motive gets a little dicey. Not yours, mine. Mm, let's edit. My motive gets a little dicey, right? I have, I have a story. Um, when I was selling cars... I, I uh, was living at home for a time, and my, I was starting to come back to the Lord. It was kind of in that, in that pivot point in my life that I was talking to my dad, and we got on the topic of tithing. And he encouraged me and kind of challenged me like, a, like a, a good mentor would. They never, you know, put challenges in front of you to help you grow. So he challenged me to tithe for three months. And I was like, okay, I will tithe for three months. And my pay... Uh, system was I had a base pay and then commission after that. I made my base pay. I did not make a commission for three months. And I was like, this doesn't make sense because this is the only area in the Bible that God welcomes a challenge is in our money, is in tithing. And so I'm like, God, I, what's going on? I'm doing what you asked and I'm not seeing the blessing from it. I'm not seeing the benefit from it. Where's my Jesus money insurance? Making claims, Colin? Is there numbers in the Bible? Oh, Bible humor, come on. Uh, but then I saw, after three months, I was ready to just throw in the towel. Ready to just throw in the towel. And I talked to my dad and just was like, hey, your, your way is not working, bud. And he's like, try it one more month. Try it. And I said, okay, one more month. That month? Best month I ever had in the car business. I more than tripled my month. I made, I made twice as much as those three months combined. See, my motive was just to get insurance on my, on my 90%, was just to check a box. That, that month checked my heart. And ever since then, my life is like this. I tried easy in, easy out. God, it's all yours. The, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. So if he wants to take it from my hands and put it into someone else's hands, by all means, it's yours. Take it. I'm not going to live like this anymore. I'm not going to fight everything and clinch and grasp and strive for, for the next thing. I'm going to live in gratitude and response to Jesus for what he's done in my life. And I'm going to open up and release it. I'm going to release the fear I have. I'm going to release the doing. I'm going to release the striving. I'm going to release the ego. And say, Jesus, in comparison to you, I understand I'm nothing. And that I'm everything to you because you came down and died for me. That's the tension that I live as a Christ follower. And if you would bow your heads with me. Jesus, thank you so much for your love. Thank you so much that you came to earth to love me. You, you showed me how to love, and you did it firsthand. Lord, I pray that everyone in this room understands the love of the Father for them as a son or a daughter. Lord, I pray that, that we would not no longer strive, but we would keep in step. Lord, that we would we would acknowledge you as the leader of our life and we would release and open our hands. And Jesus, I want to give one moment right now with heads bowed and eyes closed. If you do not know Jesus as your loving Savior,
and you would like to today, I would love to give you that opportunity to say yes to Jesus. If that's you raising your hand or looking up at me, we'll pray a prayer and we'll, we'll have that moment of eternal love happen. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Amen. Amen. And if that's you today, it starts here by acknowledging that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. And you believe that that Savior is the Son of God, Jesus, who died on the cross for your sins and covered you. And then now you just commit to the life of sanctification. You lean into the tension. You commit to becoming more like Christ. And as a church, we're here to walk with you through that. Thank you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen.